Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, both free sites. Today is Super Bowl Sunday, February the 3rd, 2019. So, what better time to talk boxing? Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let's face it. I know today it's a big feel-good story. But let's lead this by pointing out that Sergei Kovalev still has major problems. Right? He has to rework his personality. Right? Being a big bully doesn't age well. You're the man in your 20s, you're sneering at everyone, you're behaving poorly outside of the ring. People will look the other way. They'll say, my God, he's talented. You get into your 30s, your mid-30s, which is where he is, and people start avoiding you. People start shaking their heads. You should know better at this age. Right? Before we talk boxing, I just want to say, look, he was impressive yesterday. Great. The allegations against him right now are serious, right? They are serious. They're also specific. He might not be back in the ring for legal reasons for quite some time. As boxing fans, let's look at the entire man. Right? He needs to change his life. Put it this way. The old Sergei Kovalev was such a lout that on the telecast here, the guys were astonished. Longtime boxing guys like Max Kellerman were astonished that Kovalev was actually friendly and gracious and wanted to touch gloves before the first round. Right? Something that is just inherent to guys like Vladimir Klitschko. Big punchers. Big punchers. Accomplished fighters. But also sportsmen. Right? So let's hope this is a new beginning for Kovalev. Right? Let's hope the allegations are false. If the allegations are true, then quite frankly, Kovalev should have his boxing license revoked. Right? Quite frankly, if the allegations are true, Kovalev doesn't belong on my boxing channel. He belongs on my crime channel here on YouTube. Now let's talk about the performance. As I've said, excellent performance. It's striking. It's striking. The youngster on the card, Teofermo Lopez. I almost said Teofilo. Great fighter. Teofilo Stevenson. Now this is Teofimo Lopez. Right? Young guys like Lopez need to look closely at the Kovalev fight. You have a guy who's a fearsome puncher. Who has gotten to this point in his career multiple reigns as champion off of great punching power, right? He stopped some big names. Stop Jean Pascal, for example, right? But he also has one of the best jabs in boxing. So he shows up and he decides, you know what, I'm not going to go for the knockout. As he and his new corner man, Buddy McGirt, discussed, they decided he was going to keep it basic. So in the post-fight interview, he actually tells the interviewer that he had to get back to what he was doing as an amateur. Think about it guy with a big punch who decides he's going to get back to boxing. He's going to get back to his jab. And that's what he does. This fight has slow rounds. 
Kovalev's jab wins all of the slow rounds. When guys are bouncing off ropes and stuff, and that doesn't happen in this fight. When guys are just in the ring being strategic, circling each other, looking at each other, right, throwing occasional punches, understand Kovalev's jab when the two guys get close to each other is the difference maker. It's powerful. It's thudding. That's the word, thudding. You wonder why Alvarez isn't more aggressive. At one point, Andre Ward is so frustrated by Alvarez's lack of aggression that he says, look, you know, this guy was the mandatory since 2015. This guy wasn't even the guy who was supposed to fight for the title the first time. He was a replacement. You've worked so hard to get the title. How could you let it go without going for broke, basically, is what Andre Ward said on the telecast. Right? Ward clearly couldn't understand it. Right? I believe Kovalev's jab is that good. You get hit with it a few times and you realize, you know what, I could get docked out by this jab. That jab kept Elidor Alvarez on his best behavior as an opponent. He's afraid to collapse the pocket. He's afraid to get inside. Even in the rematch, he's controlled by Kovalev's jab. And the difference in Kovalev here is in the first fight, Kovalev's trying to move forward. He's trying to collapse the pocket himself. Because he's trying to use that jab to set up hooks, set up big punches, to lean into his shots, to be offensive. In this fight, he realized, you know what? I don't have to collapse the pocket. My jab's enough. It's winning me these slow rounds. It's the other fighter's burden to try to change this equilibrium. I'm on my way to victory. I don't have to risk walking into shots, trying to get up on the guy's chest, trying to be close enough to throw my hooks. No, Kovalev decides, you know what, I'm comfortable from this distance. Kovalev starts tripling up on the jab. He understands this game plan is a winning game plan. Not only that, and it's important here, he also understands that it helps his stamina. Right? He's not loading up on hooks. He's just relying on the jab. So it actually helps him pace himself. Right? Masterful performance. He's the KO puncher who is not going for the KO. Right? His cornerman, Buddy McGirt, is just telling him, look, get back to basics. Before the last round, it's striking. Buddy doesn't tell his guy, who has a huge punch, he doesn't say, take him out, make him pay. No, he says, you know what? You know what's coming. You know this guy's going to try to jump on your chest here. Right? He has to do something dramatic here. Just be aware of it, right? Buddy wants his guy thinking in terms of distance. Boxing, defense. Right, think about that. A Kovalev guy trying to urge Kovalev to be defensive, to be a boxer. Let me say too, Kovalev's conservative 
in my pre-fight video here, and I'm glad I didn't bet on this fight, right? I want you to read all the comments in that pre-fight video, people who were certain after the first fight that Alvarez was going to show up and blow out Kovalev, right? Many predictions in the comment section of that pre-fight video on an Alvarez win by KO, right? Kovalev's punch resistance looks gone in the seventh round of the first fight. Right here, you can tell Kovalev is concerned about his ability to take a punch because Kovalev is a head hunter in this fight. He's not going much to Alvarez's body. In other words, this is the thing with a beautiful jab. Larry Holmes figured this out. When you have that jab popping, and you're winning the slow rounds. The key word there is the verb. You're winning the close rounds. The burden's not on you to change that dynamic. So Kovalev is jabbing to the head. He's not even jabbing that much to the body. He's not collapsing the pocket to throw hooks to the body. He's even more conservative than Buddy McGirt wants him to be because Buddy at one point says, hey, you need to go to the body. Right, Kovalev's going up top. Kovalev's winning rounds going up top. Alvarez makes mistakes. Now think about it. This is a fighter who lost to Andre Ward when Ward gets inside. Doesn't stay outside at jab level. No, gets inside. Is bouncing around deep in the pocket. The fight's competitive. We're talking about the second fight. The fight's competitive, but understand, Andre is focused on Kovalev's body. Kovalev, big puncher as he is, is actually a lean guy. He's a hunter. He doesn't like being hunted. Right? Ward gets close to him, too close for the jab, is moving deep in the pocket. Kovalev doesn't have great defensive skills. He isn't a guy who clinches. Right? So Andre Ward's able to be over here and hit him with body shots. Alvarez, because he has success in the first fight, landing an overhand right, is focused on doing that here. He doesn't get low. Get under the jab. Hide his head. Kovalev's head hunting. Don't you want to hide your head, right? Turn, give him a shoulder, get low so he can't find you with the jab. Then jump inside. Don't you want to be Joe Fraser bobbing and weaving to get by Ali's jab? You're fighting a good jabber. You stay in jab range, you're going to get pummeled. You don't hide your head, you're going to get pummeled. You stay outside, that's where the jabber wants you. Right? Alvarez here is backing up. He doesn't collapse the pocket, hide his head, and get inside. Right? He's trying to throw a right hand over the jab. Right? Kovalev wisely is doubling and tripling up the jab. On the telecast, you hear about Kovalev's bad habits from both Timothy Bradley and Andre Ward. They talk about how Kovalev will throw a jab and won't bring his hand all the way back. Why would he? He's the hunter. People are fleeing the pocket. They're not even there to counter him. They're not there to throw something over the jab. So the solution Kovalev has here is he's doubling the jab. Right? In other words, rather than have you time a punch after his jab, he pumps it more than once. Right? So this way, your timing has to be that much better. This way, if you don't get the punch off, 
He's hitting you hard with that second jab. Let me say this too. And I think it's important. Right, Kovalev makes a big defensive adjustment in this fight. Alvarez seems to think that if he just sticks around, he's going to have a round like the last round of the first fight. You know his home run punch is that right hand, right? <coughs> Straight right hand. Has a little bit of a loop in it. So Kovalev, instead of going back, knowing that Alvarez wants to hit him from distance, instead of going back into the firing range of that right hand, when Alvarez is ready to throw it, Kovalev leans forward. Right? You'll notice Kovalev is inside of Alvarez's right hand at times in this fight. Now what's amazing to me, and keep in mind Alvarez not a high KO percentage. Not a high KO percentage. What's amazing to me is that Alvarez doesn't make the adjustment to move off his plans of landing a straight right hand and doesn't go to plan B. Right? He should have had a plan B. You're fighting a jabber, clinch the jabber. Right? Bob and weave your way in, get low. You don't even have to throw punches. I'm not saying it's easy. You don't even have to throw punches. Cover your head. Get low. Run inside. Right? Do a Bernard Hopkins. Just get inside. Throw body shots. You're against a guy whose punch resistance is a little suspect who lost to Andre Ward off body shots. Don't you want to bring up those bad memories? No, Alvarez is too conservative. He's too much in jab range. He's too discouraged by Kovalev's jab. He doesn't go to a plan B. Right? This is a cautious fight. Both guys are cautious. Now let's talk about the storm clouds that Kovalev faces going forward. You know... Alvarez is on his back foot, which is perfect for Kovalev. Right? Because Alvarez isn't trying to back Kovalev up. There's an open question, and I think we know the answer. Kovalev's in his mid-30s. On whether Kovalev could throw that jab backing up. I don't think he can. It's a great jab. But understand... It's a great jab as part of a heavy-handed guy's arsenal. Kovalev's accustomed to opponents being defensive against him. He's the guy who usually lets his hands go. He's not accustomed to guys collapsing the pocket on him. Is it possible to pull the plug on Kovalev's jab by getting him to fight backing up? Right? You almost never see a lot of Kovalev on his back foot. Have you noticed that? You just don't. Alvarez is backing up from the first round. Right? He, he decides he's going to not allow a pocket to settle. So he's trying to make the pocket mobile. He's backing up against the jabber. Right? So we never see Kovalev have to figure out the footwork needed to still have leverage on his jab as he backs up. Right? It's a Carlos Monzon jab. It's not an Ali jab. Right? Monzon, big jab. Monzon, a puncher like Kovalev, big jab from the pocket. Because Monzon was a big puncher, you never really saw a guy collapse the pocket, Benny Briscoe tries, collapse the pocket, get Monzone on his back foot, where he would have to be up on his toes. Different world. 
right? Kovalev isn't forced on his back foot where he has to be up on his toes. Where he has to time the jab. So if it's going to have the power, he's going to have to have it where he can move his feet but yet still generate the power on the jab. Now, Bivol, another champion at 175 pounds, is a combination puncher who collapses the pocket, who throws body shots. If Bivol collapses the pocket and is high volume on Kovalev, will Kovalev's jab be a factor if Kovalev has to be the one backing away from the pocket? Right? Maybe Kovalev then gets back to old Kovalev and starts throwing hooks and stuff like that. Maybe Kovalev welcomes the shootout. We never get to a shootout in this Alvarez rematch. Let me also say, too, that this fight's at a measured pace. You see that by the number of punches Alvarez throws. Right? Alvarez doesn't throw a lot of punches in the fight. Now, it's surprising. I know both guys are in their mid-30s. But if you have questions about Kovalev's stamina, the last thing, as an opponent, you want Kovalev to do is to be able to pace himself. Right early in the fight, Andre Ward and Timothy Bradley on the telecast say, you know what, Alvarez, he'll be happy if he just splits the early rounds. Right, Alvarez told Andre Ward that Kovalev's punching power wasn't the same after the sixth round of their first fight. Right, so the idea was, you know, Alvarez is just going to hang around a few rounds. And then, in the later part of the fight, put the pressure on uh, Kovalev, who doesn't have the best stamina. Well, folks, you have to bank body shots early, don't you? You have to force the guy who has questionable stamina to actually work in those early rounds if you're going to wilt him late. Instead, we get Kovalev able to live off a jab. He doesn't have to worry about too many body shots. He's in against a low-volume opponent. Now, he's not going to have that if he fights Bivol, is he? Let me also say, too, that Groovestick Stevenson fight, right? Groovestick has a share of the belt at light heavy, right? Stevenson's hanging tough. Then you get to the later part of the fight. That's when Groovestick reminds Stevenson that Stevenson's in his 40s, right? You get to the part of the fight where an older man's stamina might be challenged. Grosdick challenges it. Right here, Alvarez, again, in part because Kovalev's jab is a thudding jab. Right? I believe it hits harder than it even looks on film. You notice that Alvarez always seems mindful of not getting caught. He doesn't push Kovalev enough to have Kovalev's stamina even be a question late in the fight. Let me say this too. He does land that right hand a few times in the fight. Kovalev does take it. But it's pot shot type stuff. In other words, he lands the punch. He then doesn't just throw caution to the wind, get in the pocket and say, okay, look, this guy's jab is won most of the fight. I need a stoppage. I need to take advantage of any time I have Kovalev dazed. Alvarez doesn't do that. He's simply too cautious. Excellent win by Kovalev. The jab dictated things. Let's just say, though, that his opponent cooperated. 
right? Alvarez's strategy, he's too cautious. He's trying too hard to land a straight right hand. He doesn't test Kovalev's body. He doesn't force Kovalev to work as hard as needed to wilt a guy with questionable stamina. Right, you get to the ninth round, the tenth round, no urgency from Alvarez, even though the scorecards of the people at ringside and ESPN Plus had Andre Ward scoring the fight. All had Kovalev well ahead. Right, well ahead. Think about it. As acrimonious as Kovalev's interaction with Andre Ward was, right, Andre Ward was scoring the fight. Andre's a pro. Andre had Kovalev well ahead. Right, Kovalev's corner, excuse me, Alvarez's corner knew Kovalev was ahead. They knew they needed something big in the last third of the fight. And Alvarez fought cautiously. Didn't push the envelope. Right? Bad strategy. Played into Kovalev's strengths. As I said, Kovalev was winning the slow rounds. That's what an excellent jab does for you. Judges notice it. You're landing the thudding punch with regularity. The other guy's not doing much. No one's hitting the canvas. It's not a high volume round. Alvarez needed to change that dynamic and didn't. Now let's talk about prospect Teofimo Lopez. Right? Few prospects in the sport have this level of talent. The guy has a Floyd Mayweather-esque left hook. In fact, he ends the fight on two left hooks. It's explosive. He can lead with it. The guy is like Floyd when it comes to recognition skills. Folks, master counterpuncher, right? He's throwing uppercuts as counters. He's fighting a savvy veteran, Diego Magdaleno. And when he sees an opening, Lopez is able to throw the perfect counter for it. As I was watching Lopez, I thought, my goodness, this guy's one of the better counter punchers. And he's a young kid. Right? That left hook, he doesn't need another power punch. He has a great uppercut. But that left hook is going to give a lot of southpaws problems. Right? It's sudden. But understand, and the person he needs to talk to is Floyd Mayweather. In fact, I'd like for him to talk to Michael Jordan. I'd like for him to talk to Roger Federer. Right? You're talking about rare talent here. But there's a hole in his game, and it's huge. Folks need to understand that Mayweather, who had these same offensive tools, right? Mayweather might even have more, because Mayweather has a damn good straight right hand and can lead with it, right? But understand, young Mayweather focused on defense. What I want Lopez to do, because Lopez, make no mistake, I'm going to criticize him here, but he has a chance to be great. Life's unfair. Not everyone has this level of talent. But what Lopez needs to do is he needs to watch every day. Repetition is important. He needs to watch Floyd winning his first world title over Gennaro Hernandez very shrewd boxer. Right? By chance, one of the guys announcing the fight who thoroughly enjoyed what Mayweather was doing was former heavyweight champion George Foreman. And the telecast is fun to watch. It's on YouTube. Because Foreman comments on Mayweather's footwork. Right? Mayweather is methodically making sure that he's not only offensive, 
right? Throwing great counters, making Hernandez think. But Mayweather is defensive, right? Steps to the side, is out of range. Steps back in range, is ready with counters. Blocks shots. Tries not to get hit. Right? Lopez wants to fight Lomachenko. Let me say this. That'll always be a bad idea. He needs to understand that he's a pot shotter, like Mayweather. He's a pot shotter. Lomachenko is high volume. Thinks faster. Is that politically incorrect to say? Thinks faster ambidextrous would overwhelm him. In other words, Lopez would be looking for that perfect counter. And Lomachenko would be giving him different angles, coming in, overwhelming him. Understand, several men have quit against Lomachenko. They've been overwhelmed. When Lomachenko fights a pot shotter like Rigondo. Right? Rigondeau is outgunned. He can't handle the volume. Floyd's toughest fights were against guys who ran red lights, who threw a lot of volume. Right? People like Emmanuel Augustus. Right? My point to you here is that Lopez seems to think that if he shows up Lomachenko is going to be right in front of him for that perfect, well-timed counter, right? That style will never be the ideal style for an opponent against a pot shotter. Understand, Floyd wisely avoided fighting Antonio Margarito. High volume guy who was willing to trade, who was going to throw five shots, right? That perfect window, that window of opportunity that counterpunchers look for, wilts, when you're fighting a guy who is going to push the tempo of the fight past the point where you can, as Lopez said in his post-fight interview, pick your shots, right? So in the 50s, guys like Joe Lewis were overwhelmed by Rocky Marciano. Right? You have your hands up. Marciano will hit you on your guard. You start to open up. You see an opening for a counter. You start to throw it. Marciano's hitting you with a bevy of shots. That's who Lomachenko is. Right? Lopez at this stage shouldn't be confusing the Diego Magdalenos of the world with Vasil Lomachenko. More importantly, Lopez is standing upright. He's accustomed to being the offensive juggernaut in the ring. He got hit several times, too many times, by Magdaleno. He needs to understand, too, that the best have a standard. That as blessed as Michael Jordan was offensively, right, Jordan's always blessed offensively. One year, he averages 37 points a game in the NBA. As blessed as he was offensively, as blessed as prime Kobe was offensively. Jordan and Kobe worked hard defensively. Jordan one year wins NBA Defensive Player of the Year. Right After scoring on you, these guys had more work to do. Kobe would try to stop you, smother you, defensively. Now I'm looking at Lopez who's full of himself. Not as good as he thinks he is. Gifted, but we're hearing second round KO versus Diego Magdalena. Get real. Didn't happen. Didn't come close to happening. But more importantly, he's standing upright. He's getting hit with 
shots to the body, counters to the body. Right? And he thinks this is a takeover? Right? The time to learn defense is now. It's early in your career. Right? Lopez needs to become defensively blessed. If you're looking at great fighters like Floyd Mayweather, you need to understand that defense is a huge part of Mayweather's game. Having a Mayweather left hook isn't enough. That's just the starting point. It's like a basketball player looking at Jordan's offense and saying, oh my God, I, you know, I need to get these skills. Getting the skills and then thinking they're Michael Jordan, not realizing Jordan's defensive greatness. It's like someone deciding, hey, I'm going to get Steph Curry's three-point shot. Getting that three-point shot and being unaware that Steph Curry led the NBA in steals one year. Look that up. Right? So right now is the time because in your late 20s, it's too late. Right now is the time. For Lopez, in fights against KG vets like Diego Magdalena, to say, you know what, in this fight, in addition to being a great, crisp counterpuncher, showing my punch pattern recognition skills, right, throwing great double left hooks, tremendous ending to the fight. What Lopez needs to tell himself is, you know, I'm not going to get hit in this fight. Because Magdaleno doesn't have a big punch, this is the perfect fight, especially since Magdaleno is a cagey, experienced veteran. This is the fight where I need to sharpen my defensive skills. Right? Understand, Roger Federer, whoever he's facing in tennis, could be a low rank player. Right? Roger Federer never deviates from trying to be brilliant in all phases of the game. Right? He has a standard. It doesn't matter if you're the best or if you're not quite the best. He has a standard. This is what makes greatness. He has a standard. And he's going to meet that standard. And so if his opponent has a problem with his backhand, Sure, Federer's going to exploit that, but Federer's also going to make sure that he's exploiting other things, that he's showing you how great he can be, right? They talked to Joe DiMaggio once, and they said, Joe, why do you play hard every day? And he said, because there's some fan out there who might be seeing me for the first time, right? So to Lopez... Look, you have the counter-punching skills down. You frame punch as well. Your counters are crisp. Right? You're above average defensively. If you want to be great, if you want this to be a takeover, if you want to talk about hopping in the ring with the best fighters pound for pound in the sport, Vasil Lomachenko, two-time Olympic gold medalist, and guys like that, you got work to do. Your defense is not there. Right? It's not Mayweather level. If you're in your early 20s, you need to seriously spend 18 months to 2 years becoming defensively blessed. That'll help you make the case for greatness in your later 20s, early 30s, right? Lopez is not the athlete as a young man that Manny Pacquiao was, right? Pacquiao, understand, while he doesn't have the in-the-pocket body armor of a Floyd Mayweather, while Pacquiao doesn't have it worked out where an opponent's going to 
throw certain punches, his head's hidden, the punch is landing off his shoulder, while he doesn't have the complete defensive game of a Mayweather. Pacquiao's a freak athlete. He moved faster than everyone else. Lopez needs to realize he's not that athlete. Right? He doesn't have Ray Leonard level hand speed. Right? He doesn't have the legs of Pacquiao or Mayweather. So if you're going to be a technician, if you're going to be counter punching, setting up counter punches, pot shotting, picking your shots, his words, not mine, then what you're going to have to do is study the Mayweather tape. The best move that guy could do, and I'm serious about this, would be to call up the Mayweather group and say, look, I'd like to come out and work with Floyd. Whatever it takes. Right? Pay Floyd for his time, or sometimes old fighters are there to give tips and stuff like that. He has the offense down. He's a gifted fighter. He has a chance to be great. He needs to have that Jordan mindset, where whoever the opponent is, in whatever city they're playing, whether the match is nationally televised or not, he needs to say to himself, okay, I'm going to work on my defense. I want to be able to fight a guy like Hanaro Hernandez and not get hit. He's flat-footed here, folks. He's not up on his toes. He's not showing a lot of lateral movement against Diego Corrales. Right? He's not stepping to the side and making sure he's covering all the bases. He's made a decision. Excuse me, Magdaleno. He's made a decision that Magdaleno doesn't hit hard enough to challenge him. So he's taking shots. Those bad habits come back to haunt you. Later in your career, when you're fighting a guy like Gervonta Davis, and those shots are hard shots, right? The time to develop good habits is right now, right? Lopez has a lot of hard work to do. I shouldn't be watching a telecast, watching a pot shotter, fighting a guy who doesn't have a big punch. And being so full of himself that I'm hearing that the guy wants to take on Vasyl Lomachenko. Right? I got to tell you, if Lopez fights Nicholas the Axeman Walters, and if he's around the pocket like this and he's getting hit with counter shots to the body like this, he's going to get stopped. Right? Don't be Adrian Broner. Don't be a guy who comes up and thinks he's about billions and he's going to be the next Mayweather. Be someone else. Be a Michael Jordan who understands that to be the next Jerry West, he has to have his defense so primed that he's in the running for Defensive Player of the Year. That making the all-defense team is a foregone conclusion. That's with 30-point-per-game capability. Right? So I'm impressed by Lopez. But understand, when you're a prospect with talent, there comes a responsibility. He has the reflexes. He's mentally wired to be a counterpuncher. Right? He has the concussive lead left hook. Now he needs to get the mental approach where whoever he's fighting, Diego Magdaleno, instead of telling us, oh, this is a two-round fight, instead, look, leave that at the door. Instead, show up and mentally say to yourself, okay, look, this guy's not going to land on me. When this guy tries to throw counters to the body, I'm going to be outside of the pocket.
right? I'm going to make it so I judge my performance. Not by his time in the 100, but by my time in the 100. Right? I have a standard. I'm not going below that standard. My biggest opponent is going to be myself. Who's going to be the hardest on me in boxing? It's going to be me. Because I'm going to have very high expectations. Right? Lopez has a chance to be great. Right? He needs to realize if he's going to be a pot shot and counter puncher, high volume guys who run red lights who are also technicians, combination punchers, are going to be hard to beat even as he hones his skills. He himself might have to avoid an Antonio Margarito to keep an unbeaten record. Right? But what he needs to do is when he's facing guys who are KG vets who, you know, are, you know, trying to counter him to the body like Magdaleno was, um, he needs to be ready to, even as he's winning a round, to be mindful defensively. To say, I need to always have defense on my mind. Right? He's not Mayweather today. He needs to realize it. People here online need to tell him. He's missing a big part of the Mayweather story, the defensive part <laughs> of the Mayweather story. Being above average on defense doesn't mean you're great on defense. If Lopez wants to be great in his early 20s right now, is when he has to figure out that that means that he has to be as good on defense as he was on offense at the end of this fight. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Let me just flatly say too, if a Lopez versus Lomachenko fight is announced this year, I'll be in line at the sports book betting on Vassal. That's how I see it. Thanks for stopping by.